Good evening, I'm Mike Knetter, and welcome to the UW Now live stream series where we bring you experts from the UW community to talk about timely and important topics. Up tonight, we'll be discussing the latest in an array of stimulus plans, this one known as the infrastructure bill uh, by some uh, proposed by the Biden administration. What is the expected impact of this proposal on GDP growth, unemployment, and inflation? And how are we gonna pay for it? And what are the risks associated with the plan? Joining us for what I'm sure will be a stimulating discussion are two UW Now veterans. Dana Peterson is the chief economist at the conference board. And Kim Rule is the Mary Sue and Mike Shannon chair in economics and an associate director of the Center for Research on the Wisconsin economy. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, uh, you have both been on the show before and I felt a little bad that you were both on topics that were a lot narrower than your normal range of expertise. So I thought we'd give you the whole playing field tonight with the macro economy. So thanks for joining us. Kicking us off tonight is Dana Peterson. Dana is the chief economist and center leader of economy, strategy and finance at the conference board, which is a business membership organization that conducts economic and management research. Peterson analyzes global economic themes having direct financial market implications, including monetary, fiscal and trade policy, debt, taxation, environmental, social and governance investing, and demographics. Her analysis of credit, equity, foreign exchange and commodity markets, public policy and asset allocation is regularly featured in global print and broadcast news outlets. Prior to the conference board, she served as North American and global economist at Citibank and previously on the staff at the Federal Reserve Board in Washington, DC. She received her undergraduate in economics at Wesleyan and a master's in economics at UW-Madison. Dana, thanks for coming back and kicking things off tonight. I know you uh, have done a lot of work on this issue and could probably uh, hold forth for an hour. So I appreciate you giving us the highlights and uh, We'll get Kim's take and then we'll have a lively discussion. Thank you so much, Mike. It's great being back. Okay, so let's talk about the American Jobs Plan and Made in America Tax Plan, AKA the Infrastructure Plan. So let's let's discuss, well, what's in it. Let's take a look at the next slide. So, well, okay, so let's look at the highlights. So um, on balance, uh, there's about two point to $5 trillion in spending over the next eight to 10 years uh, that the current administration is suggesting. Um, meanwhile, the Made in America tax plan that was paired with the American Jobs Plan uh, calls for about $2 trillion in revenues over 15 years. And for the sake of just kind of doing a quick and dirty analysis, we're assuming that you get that first $1.33 trillion in the first 10 years. Um, this kind of nets out over 10 years to $1.1 trillion of uh, additional uh, uh, burdens, if you will, on the federal government uh, in terms of the budget balance. So this would widen the deficit uh, by a net sum of, of $1.1 trillion over 10 years. So what does this mean? I'm going to talk about what it means for the deficit and debt. But also, what does it mean for GDP growth? Uh, so basically, it means GDP growth will be stronger in the years, uh, the first and, and second years that uh, this is implemented. And we're saying that potentially um, it's going to take some time to get this through Congress if, if, it, if it makes it through Congress. But most likely, we probably wouldn't see any beginning effects until maybe next year. Uh, but certainly next year and the year after that, you'd see uh, pretty strong U.S. GDP growth as a consequence. But then you'd have a few years of fiscal drag, which essentially means that you're not getting the same impulse, right? Because the amount of money or spending is less uh, later on relative to at the beginning. Um, also, you would potentially have faster inflation. And right now, there are a lot of concerns about inflation in the U.S., given the fact that prices for uh, both goods, well, for goods, uh, both uh, at the producer uh, level and also for consumers are rising, and then you have backlogs, and et cetera. Plus, you had three rounds of, of fiscal supports, um, including uh, stimulus checks that went out. And now we're talking about another plan with 
$2.25 trillion worth of spending. Um, so you could potentially have faster inflation that's above the Fed or Reserve Board's uh, 2% target. Um, and really that target they look at is uh, the core or rather the personal consumption expenditure deflator, less food and energy, and it's called core PCE deflator. Um, so essentially uh, faster inflation and also um, the fact and also lower jobless rates, right? So you have an overheating economy uh, for a few years and then potentially uh, higher rates when the economy slows. And all this in the short run, meaning over the next you know couple of years, certainly poses a challenge to the Fed's plan to keep interest rates unchanged or at, at, at very low zero bound levels through 2023. So let's take a look at the next slide. So this next slide, sorry, it's so tiny. I can, I can hardly see it myself, but oh, great. That's good. That's a little better. Um, so what's in it? Uh, most of it, I would say, is aimed at infrastructure. Some of the infrastructure is just kind of general public infrastructure, highways, roads, bridges, um, and that's kind of around $621 billion. Then you have infrastructure that's uh, kind of on uh, things that, uh, that are less public, like buildings, um, education, uh, schools. Um, so, and it, it was quote unquote spending at home. That's how it's been termed. And a lot of that is infrastructure spending. Some of it is actually hiring people. Um, but most of it, again, is infrastructure. And then you have the care economy, where you're providing housing for the aged and disabled persons. Um, that actually, uh, it's a little bit, I, you know, despite that label, it's actually not infrastructure spending. It's just raw spending, uh, government spending. And then there's a lot of spending on R&D and manufacturing and training. And all that's, again, raw spending, not infrastructure spending. So a good chunk of what's being planned is actually not infrastructure. <laughs> so even though people call the infrastructure bill or infrastructure plan, a lot of it isn't. Um, and then you have uh, the revenue. And so the White House's fact sheet says that they're hoping to raise $2 trillion in revenue over 15 years. Um, all of it focusing on raising taxes for corporations. So that includes uh, raising the, um, the statutory tax rate. So statutory basically means that's the official tax rate. Um, the effective rate is what you actually pay. So for a lot of corporations, the effective rate is lower than the statutory rate, but nonetheless, uh, those rates are, are would rise. And then also a lot of increases in corporate taxes uh, associated with uh, uh, you know, multinationals, um, you would close loopholes, you would uh, prevent co companies from inversions. And basically that means uh, locating your headquarters in a country with low taxes so that you don't have to pay as much taxes as if you locate your headquarters in the US. Um, and then there was also something in there that wasn't given a price tag, but essentially extending uh, tax credits, energy tax credits, which uh, some of which expired last year, some are expiring this year. Um, so extending them until who knows how long, maybe forever, but that also has a cost, but it's not clear exactly how much. Um, so for our analysis, we didn't include that uh, because we just couldn't price it out. And what I did find didn't seem to add up to what I saw in the news, but nonetheless, we're looking at all the stuff in, in the black lettering. So let's go to the next slide. So uh, first, when we priced this out, uh, pretty much the day that it was published, we said, okay, what if this bill, these bills, because they're effectively, well, these two plans, if it's in one bill, um, and potentially that's what they want, one bill, are passed today. So you would see um, the raw spending on things like R&D and manufacturing and hiring people, a lot of that would get pushed into the first couple of years. Um, and so you see uh, in the chart in the upper left-hand corner, you see the outlays or effect, which means spending. And so you see a lot of it in the first uh, year or so, but then you see even more later on. And that's when the infrastructure spending really kicks in, right? It doesn't happen right away because even if you pass an infrastructure bill today, 
you still have to do a lot of planning. You have to hire surveyors and architects, you know, a lot of people uh, to plan before you actually dig a hole in the ground um, and do anything. Um, and one thing I would mention though, is that a lot of the infrastructure spending that's uh, proposed is actually not on anything new. So anything new would be called greenfield infrastructure. Um, most of what's being planned is fixing what's broken. And so that's called brownfield, right? But even still, it takes it takes planning. Um, and so you don't really see a big uh, pickup in spending until years two and three and four. And then over, then over time, that spending goes away. So that's the navy blue area. Um, and then the light blue area, those are your revenues. And you don't really start to, you, you'd see the revenue impact immediately because as soon as you change the tax law, unless you say it's retro, it's, it's, you know, it doesn't matter for a few years, it affects you right now. And in some cases, they might even make it retroactive, right? Where all of a sudden you, you owe taxes. <laughs> um, so with all of that, you would see uh, larger deficits. Uh, so the light blue line, that's essentially our estimate of what deficits would look like, um, debt for sits and debt, um, both in dollar terms and also as shares of GDP. Um, I'm sorry, the navy blue lines. That's that's our estimate if you fold in the third fiscal stimulus package, right? Because the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, which usually puts out these 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 numbers, they the last update they did was in February before the third stimulus package was estimated uh, was a pass. So we have our navy blue line, which is the F estimate, and then we have the light blue line, which piles on this latest plan of infrastructure, uh, spending on R&D and taxation, raising taxes. And as you can see, even though the deficit lines don't look like they move that much, um, the debt line really does increase. And so this is what would happen if you just pass this today. If you go to the next slide, things look pretty much the same. The only difference is, is realistically speaking, it's going to take time for this to wind its way through Congress. So maybe we wouldn't actually start to see any effects until next year, right? As opposed to this year. So that just kind of shifts everything out, but certainly the debt um, as a share of GDP, that profile changes where you could potentially 10 years from now have even higher debt, you know, closer to 117% of GDP as opposed to 116%. Um, either way, it's a lot, <laughs> lots of debt here. Um, so if we go to the next slide, we say, all right, well, what if this happens? Uh, th this plan gets, these two plans get passed. Um, what are the effects on some macroeconomic indicators? So we have real GDP. So in the first couple of years, you get a boost to GDP of, you know, roughly 1.3 percentage points higher. On this, in the next year, it's uh, roughly uh, uh, 76 basis points higher. But and so you get this fiscal boost, but then you get fiscal drag, right? You start seeing that the plan actually imposes a drag on GDP. So which means GDP would be lower than than if you didn't have this plan put in, in place. So in some ways, um, you know, you could think of it as well, we're pulling some activity forward, or it's just more so that, you know, you get the biggest bang for your buck in terms of spending the first couple of years and then um, this, once the spending levels decline, you're not giving as much boost to the economy. Um, meanwhile, inflation would be uh, notably higher. Um, even in that year where you're starting to see fiscal drag, you still see um, inflation being bolstered by the fact that you've had all this really strong growth for two years. Um, meanwhile, um, when you look at the unemployment rate, we could see unemployment rates um, fall lower than what might be expected. But then if you have the U.S. economy slowing, then that's that's just, you know, the natural reactions that unemployment rises, those um, uh, those automatic stabilizers kick in. Um, so, I, you know, I would take the Fed funds rate estimates with a, you know, grain of salt. The, the point of this is not to give any point estimate necessarily, but just to show that the Fed would be challenged in terms of, you know, keeping interest rates flat, uh, unchanged, if there's another round of, of uh, spending 
that really materially boasts GDP growth and inflation. And so most likely, let's say this thing were passed today, this this year or even uh, you know late this year or early next year, um, the Fed might have to change its forecast and start raising uh, interest rates sooner rather than later. If we look at the next slide, uh, here we said, well, let's compare these deltas, right, to the conference board's own forecast. So our forecast for 2021 is 6% GDP. Next year is 3.5%. The year after that, we're getting close to uh, potential, uh, where potential is probably going to be around 1.9%, 1.8%. Um, if you add in um, the the plans, the infrastructure plan, uh, then you get a significant boost to GDP in, say, next year, right? Assuming this gets passed late this year or early next year. And then you also get a, a more of a boost in 2023. But um, the remaining portion of the decade, you see potentially slower growth than you would have because, again, you have the fiscal drag. You've got, you know, higher inflation, which sh which uh, prompts the Fed to hike interest rates and um, all sorts of things going on there that depresses growth. Um, uh, meanwhile, uh, we looked at inflation. I'm sorry, we looked at the same thing for, for against the Bloomberg consensus. And that's basically uh, a survey of all forecasters who like to send in their forecasts to Bloomberg. So that includes people like us, but also lots of banks and um, other uh, think tanks and financial institutions. And you know, you get the same story where you'd see faster growth um, over the next couple of years. Uh, and if we go to the next slide here, I think this is my final slide, we have what what would happen to inflation. So the navy blue line is our estimate of where we think inflation is going to go. So faster inflation this year and then also next year, and then kind of settling back down to 2%. Uh, and then, again, this is the core inflation measure that I mentioned at the top of the hour. Uh, but if you have the infrastructure plan put in place, then you'd have notably faster inflation. And while the Fed has said uh, that it's, you know, after the third stimulus package was passed, the Fed said, look, you know, we expect that there's going to be some inflation and that prices are going to be above our target for some period of time. But we think it's going to be transitory. Right. This this doesn't look very transitory. <laughs> it looks like, you know, prices are going to rise um, and be above the, the target for a little bit longer than maybe the Fed is comfortable with. And then we did the same thing with the consensus forecast. So I think, um, you know, there, there are positives and negatives to this. Uh, one positive is, you know, in the next couple of years, you could have stronger GDP growth, but it comes at the cost of fiscal drag later. Um, also, because a lot of these infrastructure investments are fixing what's broken, you're not necessarily uh, enhancing total factor productivity, which is a contribution to GDP when you look at it from the supply side. So supply side GDP, you have your contribution from labor markets, your contribution from uh, capital uh, investment, and then you have your productivity, your total factor productivity. And total factor productivity is what you get from past investments in technology and, and things like um, infrastructure. And so if you're just fixing what's broken, yeah, you'll get a little bit of a bump to, to, to total factor productivity, but not as much as you would get if you were building you know, new, new bridges and roads, et cetera. Um, and then you, know, you also have, uh, this will probably be the final thing I'll say, you also are still saddled with uh, pretty large annual federal budget deficits and mounting debt. And so right now, the world seems to be okay with that. Um, but ultimately, investors are going to start punishing the U.S. for having these outside def these outsized deficits and expanding debt because the question is, well, how do you pay for it, right? <laughs> um, and so once – and how would markets punish the U.S. by raising – the rate of the interest rate for borrowing, right? So that means uh, the government would spend more money paying interest um, and less on investments back into the economy. Um, and also, when you think about where investors, you know, consumers or 
financial firms would invest, um, they'd be, you know, probably more likely to invest in financing this debt than investing in in capex or other areas. So there are positives and negatives to this. I mean, yes, um, I live close to New York City, and <laughs> the roads are terrible. The airports need help, and the bridges. Um, you know, you never know when they might collapse, but Still in all, um, there's a lot in this bill. Some of it is infrastructure, a lot of it isn't. And there are positives and negatives that we're gonna see if it's passed. I'll stop there, thank you. Great, well, thank you, Dana, for that great overview of, of the plan. And you know, if I've learned anything from following this lately in the news, it's that politicians have gotten better at naming things. That's for sure. You know, <laughs> these plans sound like motherhood and apple pie, but they're more complicated as you just uh, articulated. So I'm sure we'll have some great questions like, when is it time for me to sell my stocks? I'm sure that's what our audience <laughs> wants. So we'll have you back in a few minutes. Um, uh, Kim Rule is up next. And uh, Professor Rule is the Mary Sue and Mike Shannon Chair in Economics and Associate Director of Crow the Center for Research on the Wisconsin Economy. His research focuses on international economics, models of firm heterogeneity and national income accounting. He's also a research associate at the National Bureau of Economic Research and a special sworn employee of the U.S. Bureau of Economic Analysis for some of his uh, research studies uh, of firms. Uh, Kim earned his PhD at the University of Minnesota and we're happy to have him on the faculty at UW-Madison and Kim, I look forward to your observations on, you know, what do you make of the stimulus uh, plan or the infrastructure bill, uh, or I guess it's the American Jobs Plan and the Made in America Tax Plan. <laughs> Take it away. Okay, great. Yeah, so thanks for having me. So yeah, we can go to the next slide. So um, I want to spend some time uh, maybe putting some of this stuff into, into context and looking backwards a bit more than forwards. Uh, we just had a great presentation thinking about what to expect in the future. And I want to maybe think a little bit about kind of where we've been and, and, and what this looks like compared to that. So just looking at what we're going to do, you know, do we need another stimulus? I'll give you the short answer first. We probably don't. Uh, the American Jobs Plan, then I want to walk through, you know, the, some of the issues with regards to increasing output. So increasing the growth rate of GDP. Uh, and, you know, as Dana said, it was kind of moderate and positive effects in the short run, but probably negative effects in the long run. I'll talk a little more about that. Inflation. Uh, Inflation is picking up, uh, but I'll talk about why it's probably not an issue, but um, I know better than to uh, than to try to forecast. I'll leave that to the pros. Um, and then uh, debt. So Dana finished up talking a, a lot about how we're going to pay for this. And I would like to say some more about that as well. And that's going to really come down to what happens to interest rates and, and, and kind of our ability to actually raise the tax revenues we think that we can. All right, next slide. So this is where we are right now. So in this figure, I'm plotting gross domestic product, the measure of you know all the stuff produced in the United States or equivalently all the income earned in the United States. And that's the dark red line. And then the light red line is just a very simple linear trend that I've drawn through it just to give you a sense of maybe where we would be uh, had the pandemic not happened. Uh, and then the difference between those two lines is, you know, this, the kind of shortfall with the, the recession, you know, the recessionary gap. And right now that stands at about $620 billion. Depending on how you draw that straight line, it could be a little bit bigger, it could be a little bit less, but that's about the right order of magnitude. And so you want to think about, or one way to think about it is that the economy is maybe about $620 billion below its uh, potential or maybe where it should be if had COVID not happened and things had gone the same way they had. And we're talking now about a two billion dollar, two sorry, two the two trillion dollar, uh, you know, infrastructure stimulus plan. Uh, and so, to kind of put things in perspective, that's I think a, a good place to start. Okay, next slide, please. So, just briefly, you know, it's this has been called an infrastructure plan. It's been called a stimulus plan. Um, I think it's worth just saying something about that, about whether. This should be thought of as a stimulus plan or thought of as something else. And I think when you try to think about it or when you think about it as strictly a stimulus plan the, with the goal to, you know, to boost growth and, and gross domestic product because we're in a recession, I, I think the case is less clear. And the, the, sort of the, the reason I say that is that this is a recession that's kind of different than a lot of the recessions we've had recently. If you think about maybe just the last recession, for those of you who, uh, who are old enough to remember that, I, I am. 
Uh, that was, you know, that was a recession that was caused by a financial crisis, a uh, stock market crash, housing crash. People were suddenly a lot poorer, a lot less wealth than there used to be. They started buying less stuff, can, you know, and so demand contracted. And there's this kind of Keynesian idea that recessions are caused by not enough demand. And so the government can step in and supply some demand for everybody else uh, and kind of stimulate the economy back to health. And, you know, that may or may not be a good, uh, a good theory of recessions, but it's certainly not a good theory of a supply side recession. And so what I mean by a supply side recession here is that it seems that one of the biggest issues, and there's certainly some lack of demand, there are consumers who aren't, who aren't out there spending, but one of the bigger issues is just that we've shut down parts of the economy. We've shut down big, you know, big parts of the supply of goods and services. And uh, we've seen that, for example, maybe the most starkly in things like restaurants or um, maybe uh, movie theaters or hotels. But also, if you think about um, the, the shortage of things, right? So there was an article in the Wall Street Journal today that said, finally, maybe the toilet paper supply has stabilized, right? Remember, remember all the, how hard it was to get things. Um, my wife works in the construction industry and lead times on things like kitchen appliances or cabinets have, uh, have, have almost doubled. It's just harder to get things. There's, there are supply disruptions. The car, car manufacturing industry is running out of computer chips. Uh, and so if this is a supply side recession, uh, the stimulus is probably not going to fix anything. You know, the sort of the stimulus that we need to fix the economy, and this has been said by people you know, a lot smarter than me, is that uh, we need to get rid of the virus, right? So we need to vaccinate. We need to, you know, we need to sort of get uh, the economy back to normal. But through unfortunately something that maybe the Fed and you know fiscal policy can't fix as much as we would like we would like it to. We need you know things that kind of get us back to normal that open up supply supply lines again to probably get us back to, to kind of where we were. So in that sense, the, a, a stimulus in the sense of the Keynesian idea doesn't doesn't make a whole lot of sense here. I want to differentiate that also a little bit from the idea that we, you know, the government can provide insurance, and that they've already done, right? So this is providing insurance to people who can't work because they've been closed down by the government or um, who have had, you know, job loss for those sorts of reasons. And we've seen that we've seen that in, in big, you know, big bills that have covered direct payments and extended unemployment benefits, you know, on the order of nine hundred billion dollars, and then the one point nine trillion dollar package. And so again, I want to think about that a little bit different than calling something a stimulus in the kind of traditional recession kind of approach. Right? This is something that those packages look much more like insurance uh, or maybe even bailouts than, uh, than, than, than sort of old fashioned stimulus. OK, next slide. I'm sorry, I can't. Can I see the next slide? Yeah, sorry. Thank you. OK, so now I want to. But I, you know, so maybe we don't need a stimulus, but maybe we do need an infrastructure bill. Right? These, these can you can still want to uh, to fix crumbling roads and uh, and bridges, uh, even if you don't want to approach it as being a, an economic stimulus. So uh, the job plan, as far as output goes, the idea of you know, so think a little bit about maybe just some very basic economic theory. We think that output is kind of made up of three things, and Dana touched on this right at the end of her talk. Um, you know, capital. So when economists talk about capital, they, they mean the physical things like machines and buildings trucks and roads, and some of that capital might be private, some of it might be public. Um, we talk about labor, so we mix together, you know, humans use capital to produce things. Uh, humans have something that economists sort of colloquially call human capital. So think about that as education and skills, things that, that, that we acquire. And then technology, you know, total factor productivity in, in, in her words. Uh, and those are, yeah, that's, you know, technology, both in the sense of faster computer chip, chips, but also in the sense of ideas and techniques, just in time, uh, you know, just in time in, uh, inventory systems. And that technology can be embodied both in capital and in labor, both humans and machines uh, can, can be more efficient. Right? And so just briefly, I want to talk through basically the capital and technology side where most of this bill is, is, uh, is focused and talk a bit about the long run and short run effects on growth and then get back to kind of how are we going to pay for this and, and what incentive effects does that create? Okay, next slide. So capital, um, we've already talked about this a bunch, so I'm going to kind of go quickly through this. But you know, something on the order of 620 billion dollars for transportation. Um, you know, this is it's going to be spread out over eight years, about one percent of GDP per year. So it's big, but it's not you know it's not World War II uh, level mobilization. An issue that we have, we haven't really touched on yet, but um, there's a um, certainly a very clear idea that 
with the government gives states money to fix roads and bridges, there's an incentive for governments then to back, for the state governments to back off on their spending they would have done on roads and bridges, and instead um, spend it on other parts of the of their state budget that they need to. And there's been a bunch of different studies of this. The numbers all differ, but there was a nice study uh, by Bill Dupour looking at the effects of the stimulus after the 2008 recession that was meant to be spent on roads. And he found that for every dollar of federal spending, states decreased their state spending on roads by about 80 cents. So you're not getting like a really big, uh, a really big impact on the actual infrastructure that you wanted to. And in fact, their sort of title of that article is why didn't the roads get fixed? Um, so, and then just in general, you know, increasing the capital stock, fixing these things can have a short run effect on growth, but it just typically doesn't have a long run effect, right? We accumulate a bit more capital that helps while we're accumulating the capital, but then doesn't have long run effects. Um, I would also just add that again, this is about you know, substitution. The, other, the flip side of this bill is an increase in corporate taxes and an increase in corporate taxes reduces their own incentives to invest in capital. So you might see an increase in public capital and a decrease in private capital. Okay, next slide. Uh, technology, um, I think Dan put this right, that this is less about investment and more about just spending. Uh, but the idea would be that, you know, you're spending money on the NSF and on research and development, uh, building out broadband and innovation hubs. The idea here to increase the amount of technological innovation that happens in the country, it sounds good. Technological innovation is the driver of long run growth. That's what makes countries rich is the ability to be to get more done with the amount of capital and labor that they have, not to, not to add more capital and more labor, but to get better at using what we have. The big caveat here, which is a big caveat any private firm has to deal with, is R&D is an inherently risky endeavor. It's, it's, you don't just say, hey, I'm gonna cure cancer and then just go do it, right? You try and you try and you try and eventually something happens. Uh, and so the question is, you know, can the government somehow do this better than the private sector? Um, and, and do we want them doing it, you know, sort of on our behalf? Okay, next slide. Okay, so now um, I want to talk just a tiny bit about inflation. Um, about, so there, there are things that are you know, pushing us towards more inflation. So we talked about the lack of supply. That's going to push up prices. Uh, demand will eventually return as the vaccine rolls out. People are going to want to spend money, and there's some pent-up demand. I'll show you that in a moment. And then there's been a big monetary response to the recession as well. We're talking about fiscal policy right now, taxing and spending. But you know, the Fed has been doing a lot to try to uh, pump up the economy too. There are some deflationary pressures, things that can you know, push down inflation rates. Yeah, I, I would say you know, from my own work, one of the biggest ones of those has been the idea that we can now source globally, that we can take advantage of uh, comparative advantage across countries and, and that's pushed down prices. The, the American Jobs Program uh, plan actually has a lot of kind of protectionism kind of things in there, a lot of talk about uh, you know, made in America. And it's an interesting kind of carryover from the previous administration that the, the Biden administration seems to also have it. So there may not be many uh, kind of free trade people left uh, in the government. I'm not sure. And then monetary policy. The Fed can always try to push down deflation like they normally would. Um, I would say in general, a large inflation is unlikely. So if we take a look at the next couple slides, I'll tell you why. So this is a slide that talks about maybe where uh, uh, inflation could be coming from. So on the left-hand panel, that's the personal savings rate. So that's uh, what people have been saving as a share of their disposable income. And you can see during recessions, this tends to, to go up a bit. People save more during recessions, but it's just been massive. It's just been a massive increase uh, over the last year because people, you know, when you shut down a bunch of places for people to go and spend money, they don't have much left to do with it besides save it. And so there is going to be some, probably some savings that, that people have that they'll then want to kind of turn loose once they're allowed to again. Then on the right hand side, that's the change in the money stock. And you can see that there's been in this, you know, there was a massive sort of monetary stimulus in 2008 and 9, which you can barely see in this figure. Uh, the, the amount of extra money that's been uh, sort of created in the last year has been enormous compared to that. So those would both be things that would be, you know, potentially re, uh, create some inflation. Next slide. So this is why I'm less worried about inflation. So what this is, is the Federal Open Markets Committee, the people who set monetary policy, they do a survey of everybody's you know, inflation forecasts. So this is the forecast of the people who set monetary policy. And if you look at the top panel, you can see that um, there's a bit of a distri distribution over what people think uh, inflation is going to be, uh, but it's centered around 2.3 to 2.4%. So it's a little higher than maybe the Fed would like it to be. 
The bottom panel is the important one. That's where they ask them what they think inflation is going to be in the long run, whatever that really means. But notice every single one of those people think that the inflation rate is going to be between 1.9 and 2. And that's not because they're all thinking about how to forecast this and they're coming up with the same forecast. It's because the, the people on the, on, the, on the Fed policymakers know that they have a lot of control of what that number ends up being. And so that number there, that idea that they all think inflation is going to be between 1.9 and 2, is really them sort of saying, we have a commitment to making sure that that's what inflation is going to be in the long run. And to the extent that they don't make mistakes, and they can make mistakes, and inflation can get away from them, that's the reason why inflation might not be uh, the problem that, it, that, it might, that, that some people have thought it would be. Okay, next slide. This is just, and then just very quickly, this isn't the inflation rate. This is one measure of it. This is CPI inflation. Um, so you can see in the past recession in 2007 and 2008 that there was a deflation and then you know inflation again afterwards. Inflation has actually in general been lower since the last recession. And you can see they just released today the March, the March number at about 2.6%. So that is starting to creep up. And the question will just be if, um, uh, if those are sustained. Okay, next slide. Okay, last thing I want to just talk about is how we're going to pay for this. Uh, and so in fact, let's just go ahead and just jump to the next slide here. So this is uh, a measure of federal debt as a share of GDP. So this is our debt to income ratio, if you, if you will. The 2008 recession saw uh, a, a, big, a big stimulus, um, you know, not as big as what we've been doing this recession, but uh, you see that debt to GDP ratios go from about 65% to about 100% over that period. They stay high. We haven't been paying off debt since then. And then you see they jump from about 100, 110 to about 130 uh, as we've launched these massive stimulus programs uh, that weren't matched by tax, uh, tax increases. And so uh, Dana they did a good job of, sh of you know, showing the, 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 the impact of those two things that were both in some sense, increasing our spending. And so if we didn't do something with taxes, then our debt level is going to go up. And so we have to increase taxes in order to try to offset some of that. But you know, even before all of this, we're already sort of sitting at about 130 percent of, uh, of GDP. Uh, as she also said, you know, right now, interest rates are low. Larry Summers would tell you, hey, interest rates are low. Now is the time to invest. And, you know, interest rates are low. The problem is interest rates are low right up until they're not. Uh, and then all of a sudden you have a lot of debt, interest rates are going up and it becomes more and more expensive to service that debt. So I'm going to leave us with the next slide here, which is this is the, uh, the amount of interest, right? So this is just the service on the debt paid by the federal government divided by tax revenue. So this is of all the money that the federal government brings in, what share of that, what, what fraction of that in terms of percent goes just to pay service on the debt, not to pay down the debt, not to build new roads or bridges, but just as, a, as payment for uh, borrowing in the past. And so you can see, you know, coming out of World War II here, all the way on the left, that number was sort of flirting with 15%. Uh, it drops down below 10. There's a big increase through the 80s and 90s. And that's very much because interest rates on government debt were very high and the, and the economy was growing very slowly. And so there wasn't a lot of tax revenue being raised. And we we're paying a lot, of, uh, a lot of interest on our debt. Coming into this last recession, you can see that uh, this has already been creeping up right? as we've been borrowing more. Interest rates have stayed low, but the, the amount of debt uh, has been going up. And the question is just, will that continue to go up? Right? We'll make it more and more burdensome to, um, to service the debt we have. Or will those kind of stay at, at reasonable and manageable numbers? And that's, you know, that's always kind of the long-term question about uh, how we think about big spending bills like this. Great. Well, thank you, Kim. I think those were uh, very complimentary views of the future and then kind of looking back on how we got here. Um, really appreciate both your comments. I want to ask a question about debt right as we get started. And it's really more of a fact-based question. Um, you know, the debt to GDP ratios are going up. Um, how much debt turns over over the next, say, one year or five years of all the federal government debt outstanding? Is it is it kind of locked up long term at low rates or are we financing this uh, with shorter borrowing? Any sense of that? Um. Well, the thing is that like you have right now, we are financing debt at a very low rate. 
right? And the Fed is planning on keeping interest rates close to the zero lower bound through 2023. Maybe they won't if inflation picks up this year and next year. Um, maybe they'll accelerate that to that timing to maybe sometime in 2022 or even 20. Uh, that would be <laughs> about a year's worth of acceleration. But um, once the Fed starts raising rates and interest rates are going to rise and already um, when you look at interest rates, um, they're they're picking up. So, for example, you know, the 10 year Treasury note um, and also the five year they've been rising on inflation expectations. Essentially, investors are thinking that inflation is going to be faster, so they should, you know, uh, lower the price, uh, bid up the yield, right? So that's going to have implications for debt service. And I know Mr. Summers um, says that, well, we shouldn't be worried about, you know, debt to GDP. We should be really learned, worried about the, the debt service. But, you know, if any of us had like a credit card, I mean, you can keep paying the interest all you want, but at some point you need to pay the balance, right? So I think that, um, you know, certainly the government can borrow at very low interest rates for maybe another year or so uh, to finance existing debt. But once the Fed starts raising interest rates, debt service is going to go up. And in fact, when you look at the Congressional Budget Office's expectations for debt over the next 10 years, um, the share that is debt service rises. And after a certain while, if you look over a very long term, most of the share of, G of debt that you're paying is debt service itself. So <laughs> not even the deficit, it's, it's all the accumulation of debt. I guess I was just hopeful that the current stock of debt outstanding was locked up for 10 years at really low rates. You know, and if it's if it's turning over, which I think it is, uh, more frequently, then that creates a lot more vulnerability because it's not just the new debt we've got to, you know, uh, find a buyer for, but it's that turnover. And uh, I think we are in a bit of precarious position there. Um, you know, the inflation views that that the two of you had, and it, I think it really hinges on, uh, you know, Kim pointed this out, what we think the Fed will actually do and how serious are they going to take their 2% mandate and if they do what it takes to keep it at 2%, well, they can do that. But I guess, Dana, you would probably say that might have bigger implications for that Fed funds rate that you had projected out in, in your uh, slides. Would that be correct way to think about that? Well, yes. and But I think there's something that, that should be explained here. The Fed has instituted a paradigm shift. So for many, many years, the Fed said, we don't wait for the whites of the eyes of inflation. We're going to act before we see inflation. And that goes back to the Volcker days back in the 1980s. But in the last uh, year, the Fed has said, you know what, we're changing this. We're now going to look at average inflation targeting. So that means that inflation needs to average above the 2% target for some period of time because we've been undershooting, we've been averaging below it. And so the Fed is saying, we're okay with some inflation. Right. They didn't say how much or for how long, but they're OK with some of it. They want to actually see inflation now. And the other half of that is the Fed has a full employment mandate and the Fed had that mandate before. But now it's nuanced where they're saying it's a broad and inclusive mandate, meaning they're not just going to look at the unemployment rate and say, OK, the unemployment rate's low. We're done. They're like, no, we want to look at all labor market indicators. We also care about what's happening to women, what's happening to minority groups, what's happening to people who are older workers, very young workers, the less educated, the less skilled. They want to look at all this stuff. So all that's going to play into you know, this average inflation target, targeting mandate and the broader full employment, inclusive full employment mandate is going to impact when they actually raise rates. So while you know at the same time mr summers is saying we're you know we're headed for ridiculous amounts of inflation and you know the fed's going to hike rates the fed's saying well maybe not you know thoughts on that kim yeah so uh actually thoughts on both so um just a, a quick just a little more about the 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 debt structure of the u.s economy so government debt has uh, an, an average yield to maturity right now uh, of about five years. So the U.S. government issues treasuries as short as one month and as long as 30 years, right? And so you were saying, 
If we're locked up for 30 years at a low interest rate, that's not terribly dangerous. If we're locked up for a year or two years at a low interest rate, we're much more, you know, and we're rolling this debt over and over again, we're much more susceptible to a, an increase in interest rates and something more like an Argentina style kind of a debt crisis or Mexico where it's harder to roll over debt. So, um, you know, just like Dana was talking about, yeah, these are exactly the issues uh, at hand. Um, and then, yeah, as far as inflation goes, you know, there's this, you know, there's this very old idea that uh, an independent central bank is a good central bank to have, that they can control inflation uh, because they're not worried about what the fiscal policy is doing. Uh, and whether that's been eroded or not over the past 20 years, I don't know. But we're certainly could be setting ourselves up where fiscal policy is, is you know, trying to pump up the, uh, the economy and, and leading to inflation. And then monetary policy has to push back uh, by increasing rates and, and trying to slow that down. And um, you know, that's, that's kind of always a potential problem that, or potential sort of issue. And then there's a question of, you know, which one can do a better job of, uh, uh, of that. We had a question come in from Noah Williams who wonders, um, you know, why isn't an infrastructure, you know, spending plan actually boosting growth longer term versus maybe having its bigger effect in the short term, which is, I think, what both of you agree is the net of this bill. Is it that the bill, as was alluded to, perhaps maybe isn't really that much about infrastructure? Or is it that there's some crowding out of other private investments, even with infra infrastructure spending that could, in fact, uh, impair growth rather than help it? And Kim, why don't why don't you start on this one okay. and then we'll hear from Dana? Yeah, so I mean, I think Dana said it right when, in her talk. She said, you know, a lot of this bill is not infrastructure. A lot of this bill are, are just are either, uh, you know, they're, they're subsidies towards uh, certain industries. They're payments, you know, that are going to go to labor to the labor force. Um, there's some nebulous stuff about you know innovation centers and uh, you know, R and D. Uh, and so, yeah, when you get down to it, yeah, maybe only six hundred million dollars, six hundred billion dollars of the two trillion dollars is actually going towards infrastructure. And, and I, I imagine that's a lot of what, uh, you know, a lot of what uh, the, these models are showing. And then, yeah, there's, you know, almost any model out there is going to have some kind of substitution away from as public investment goes up, private investment gets crowded out um, and whether that's crowded out. Uh, through you know the kind of the state level mechanism that I was talking about, the state governments pull back on some of their investment spending, uh, or if it drives up interest rates, which then depresses investment in the um, uh, in the private sector. And then I think the the second thing that's really being reflected in this is the big increases in taxes that they need to get in order to, to to fund this thing. And if you're raising taxes on some of the biggest companies in the United States, it's it, it you know likely will have some kind of a uh, an effect on investment. And will also kind of dampen then the the effect of uh, of these big increases that they're trying to push for in, in, in kind of infrastructure. And I would add uh, just kind of an example. If you suppose you have a bridge, right? It's already there. It it's deteriorating. It's about to fall down. So you fix it, but it's only going to stay fixed for say you know another five years. Whereas if you built a brand new bridge that bridge is going to give you 25 years, right? I'm just making up numbers here, but just imagine that, you know, as soon as you fix that thing that's broken, it's already start going to start to depreciate. And, you know, you still have to keep fixing it and working on it. And that reduces productivity uh, of, you know, people trying to cross the bridge. Now there's only one lane open. <laughs> you know, you could just imagine sure. as opposed to you just build a brand new bridge, all the lanes are open for the next 25 years. Right. So that's yeah. that's also a big problem with this bill. Yeah. Some infrastructure is probably deferred maintenance <laughs> that we've let go for a while, too. Um, you know, you've both brought up issues that I think I want to follow up on, which is really, you know, maybe maybe there is something about marketing these bills and, you know, infrastructure and stimulus sounds positive. Um, but maybe the aims of this bill are actually really kind of different than what we think of as a normal infrastructure bill. And in fact, maybe it is partly about redistribution. And this is just a good time to get spending bills through while we have a crisis. And what what do you see, you know, Kim, you mentioned a few of them, but who are the winners and losers in this? And does it maybe in some ways offset some of what happened because of the pandemic where we know people who were invested in 
you know, financial markets fairly heavily and the tech companies just really cleaned up and a lot of people did really well and other people were really hurt. Could this be partly motivated by need for some redistribution and rebalancing? What are your thoughts about that? Uh, I'm not a politician, but uh, I certainly watch enough well. news, <laughs> watch enough news to see that, you know, this is, uh, this has strong you know, democratic support and it will likely it sound and if nothing changes, it will, will probably go through on more or less a party line vote. Uh, and I think part of that is because they've shied away from keeping this, you know, just a strict infrastructure bill. Now, to be fair, infrastructure bills have been proposed for years and not passed either. So um, this is it's not clear that we would just line up to, to do a pure infrastructure bill also. But. Uh, you know, as as the Dana's pointed out, and some other people have, you know, the care economy is four hundred billion dollars. Affordable and sustainable housing is two hundred and thirteen billion dollars. A hundred hundred million billion dollars for workforce development. Um, you know, those are the kind of winners. Uh, the those sectors and the people who are employed in those sectors. Um, yeah, I think you know, the the sort of obviously, if they really do build infrastructure, then. The large construction firms who tend to run these big road and bridge projects, right? these are not mom and pop shops typically who are, who are putting together big infrastructure projects. Uh, there's certainly going to be some trickle down to the smaller ones, but it's going to still be mostly the you know, big companies who uh, on that side. On the loser side, you know, the, most of the taxes seem to be aimed at big multinational firms, and you can sort of understand why. Um, uh, they've they are there are things that they can do to try to minimize the tax that they pay and they and you know and even within just the rules that are set uh, and that this you know there seems to be a lot of kind of trying to tighten uh, rules at, around these firms and increased uh, taxes on them in order to try to pay for some of this and so it seems like that would be kind of the obvious place uh, firms that are going to firms as parts of the sector or parts of the economy they're going to be hurt most by this I think also um we have to think of this as this is just the plan, right? So you, you start big, right? <laughs> it's like bargaining, right? You start up here and then you come down, right? Um, so th there's a lot tossed into this. Um, and some people have even said this is kind of like an anti-poverty program. And indeed, the current administration has talked about introducing another plan around families and children uh, later this spring to address these, you know, income equality uh, types of issues. But Again, I think a lot of it's just kind of throwing everything into, including the kitchen sink in there. Then you negotiate it away. Maybe at the end, you do get a raw infrastructure package um, and some minor changes to taxes that everybody can agree on. But you know, uh, again, there's, uh, you know, we've seen many. We've been here before in terms of infrastructure plans, big bills that just never happen. Um, and this is going to take a lot of effort, a lot of political will. You're going to need the middle. Uh, centrist uh, Joe Manchin types to sign off on this. Um, you know, he signed. He would probably sign off on an infrastructure bill. Not sure about all the other things. I'm not a. I'm not a political pundit. Uh, just you know what I hear and read. So this is a long way from being settled, I think. But yeah, I mean, um, toss it all in there. <laughs> We have a question from Lindsay Hallstrom. Can you please explain the global minimum tax rate? Uh, that's part of that leveling out and um, I'm worried I've lost my speakers. Oh, we're here. Yeah, I, I'm here. Yeah, you seem to be freezing up a little bit, Mike. Well, I heard the question, and honestly, I, I, I don't really know what it is. <laughs> I'm, I'm not a tax expert, and you know, I'm just kind of looking at the whole thing. Um, but certainly, it's something that would, I think, what it is. Um, and Kim, jump in here at any point if you sure, know the answer. Do you know the answer? I'll let you. Uh, yeah, sure. It. I can talk a little bit about it. Yeah. So sure. this is. Um, this is all again meant to push against this idea that a, a multinational firm 
particularly ones that are that have a lot of intellectual property or intangible capital, um, can do things like move that intangible capital outside of the United States to a low tax jurisdiction, and then let profits accrue to that intangible capital. You think about it as being a patent or, so, or, or some kind of intangible idea. Um, and that allows them to earn profit kind of outside of the United States in jurisdictions and countries that have lower tax rates in the United States. And so the idea here is to uh, basically try to come up with sort of a cartel, if you want, or you might maybe a, a less incendiary thing would be to call it coordinated tax policy, where countries kind of agree uh, on a kind of a minimum tax. And so if uh, you know, if, if a U.S. firm goes to another country and with a lower tax rate than this kind of minimum tax, then the U.S. government is going to top up the tax rate on that firm on that income so that they have to sort of pay at least this minimum tax. And the idea here is that this is the big idea, and this is why the OECD has been interested in other countries have been interested in, is to try to keep uh, firms from kind of moving into places just so that they can pay less tax. Uh, and erode tax bases in uh, in kind of higher tax uh, and higher tax jurisdictions like the U.S. or the OECD. Uh, and so, yeah, this minimum tax is a so whether this minimum tax ever goes through or not, this will be the tricky thing because this is going to require a lot of coordination by uh, by many countries, all of whom have some you know incentive to try to lower their tax rates a bit and get Google to come and put a put a plant in their you know in, in their country or you know get. Uh, you know, get G General Electric to come and build, you know, a manufacturing facility there. And so this is a very tough, uh, this will be a very tough thing to do, and particularly in a way that people wouldn't want to then defect from from later. Sorry, guys, I picked up that trick last week from Barry Alvarez, who froze out three times on me as well. <laughs> <laughs> I am back. Chris Salm wonders, what is a sustainable debt level for the federal government? Anyone want to take a stab at that? Um, I know that's a really hard question to answer when you're a taxing authority and, you know, you issue the world's reserve currency and the Fed seems to be helping out. So thoughts on that, Dana? And then, Kim? Sure. According to the IMF, 70% uh, of GDP is acceptable for advanced economies. Um, <laughs> and... Many economies are, are well above that. Um, some of them were, were above that before the pandemic, and, and some are now above that. And certainly the U.S. is above that. Um, but then the question is, well, what does that mean? So for Japan, I think their debt-to-GDP ratio is like 250% or some crazy number. And, but most of the debt is owned by Japanese people. Mr. and Mrs. Watanabe, as they're, they're called, uh, those investors. And so it's not so bad because it's not like they're in the debts being it's owned by a bunch of uh, uh, foreign investors. And for the U.S., a lot of the debt is still uh, owned by China and Japan. But China and Japan have been reducing their shares and, and pension funds and, uh, uh, you know, asset uh, firms in the U.S. have been taking up some of that share. But even still, it's not and also the Fed is also taking up some of that share. But still, you know, the U.S. enjoys exorbitant privilege, um, and certainly there's no shortage of demand for U.S. debt. Even when the U.S. economy is not doing so great, there's still this flight to quality, quality meaning U.S. Treasury. So maybe it's not so bad for the U.S. to have these very elevated debt levels. It really depends upon the country um, and what the situation is. And certainly for emerging markets, a lot of them, it's much more tenuous for them to have elevated debt to GDP levels because they don't have the means. They don't have, uh, you know, their debt isn't uh, in their own currency. Um, it's owned by a lot of foreigners um, and they're on the hook for this. So it's not a clear cut answer. Kim, any thoughts on that? Uh, just very briefly, because I think she did. Uh, she sort of hit on everything. You know, the regardless of the level of uh, kind of debt you're at, it, you know, a lot of what what's going to really decide whether something's sustainable or not is how the interest rate is changing and how your ability to collect taxes is changing. Right? And so, if the economy grows really fast, debt to GDP ratios will naturally fall because the denominator is falling. Uh, but on the other hand, if GDP you know grows moderately but interest rates grow very fast, the debt to GDP ratio is going to continue to grow uh, and. And so uh, 
you know, I, you know, on top of all the other things that Dana said, that's sort of the, you know, the the other kind of variables. And unfortunately, those are hard to predict, right? We don't know uh, what's going to happen to interest rates. We don't know what's going to happen to GDP growth rates. Is, is this kind of opening a window for cryptocurrency as uh, we we run higher and higher debt levels, and the Fed, you know, accommodates this and grows its balance sheet? Um, Robert Robert Baker threw a question in that. I would interpret as largely along those lines. Any thoughts on that, Dana? Well, I mean, some of the the dawn, well, the dawn of cryptocurrencies was back during the last crisis, where folks, you know, basically uh, didn't trust the government um, and the Fed to be able to manage the financial system and the health of the U.S. dollar, and so they said, "Well, let's, you know, let's be theoretical about this and create our own currency." Um, and we can operate in that. Um, unfortunately, I mean, from the last, <laughs> we, we spent a lot of time on this in the last, uh, well, the last time I was on, um, but, you know, there are issues around adoption and even usage. Um, but still, uh, you know, some governments, like the Chinese government just launched its own cryptocurrency. So there could be issues around uh, debt service and certainly even how debt is priced if cryptocurrencies become the dominant currency globally, as opposed to the U.S. dollar. And leaving aside crypto, uh, Kim, you know, are there any threats to the U.S. dollar as being the, the global currency that you can see? Or In the short term, no. Um, but, you know, China would love to be the next uh, global currency, and they're certainly working very hard to try to be. Um, that isn't necessarily mean that something terrible will happen to the United States. The British pound used to be the dominant currency. It's not anymore. And, you know, modulo what they're doing with Brexit, the UK is doing is still done pretty well. Um, but, yeah, there's certainly and the euro, you know, it was created also as a, a as kind of a, a um, something to stand against the dollar. And so we may see at some point that the dollar becomes uh, becomes less of the dominant currency and maybe it even has a little bit till now. But um, you know, people still have a lot of faith in the American taxpayer, or at least the the U.S. government, to raise tax revenues to pay debt. And there's a lot of still a lot of faith in the in the Federal Reserve to uh, to preserve the the value of money. Um, and you know, cryptocurrency. Uh, you think about like any other kind of of currency, right? Uh, compared to a euro or or you know a pound or whatever. Cryptocurrencies are moving around a lot. They're very volatile. And I don't think anybody would want to live in a country right now whose currency is fluctuating the way that it does. Um, and you know, we've seen smaller versions of this in places like Argentina or Mexico where there are devaluations and revaluations. And those are, those are pretty disruptive. Uh, having a stable currency, regardless of whether it's uh, digital or not, uh, is going to be kind of an important part of whether that currency is adopted and, and how much it's used. Great. Well, I, I know we're past the top of the hour, and uh, you've, yeah. you've both come back for a second show uh, fairly uh, quickly after your first appearance. I really appreciate your time. Kim, I know it's crunch time at the end of the semester, so uh, we'll let you go back to writing exams. And Dana, I know it's a busy season for you with all the policy action, and you're in high demand uh, in all your appearances. And we thank you for making time for us, too. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. It was fun. Thanks, Mike. Thank you both. Well, thanks for joining us this evening. Uh, the UW Now will be back again next Tuesday, April 20th, with a special Earth Day segment on creating a cost-effective greener future. Uh, UW-Madison has a long history in studying the environment and, of course, was home to Gaylord Nelson, uh, the founder of Earth Day and many other environmental pioneers. And then on April 27th, we'll dive into U.S.-China relations with a former Supreme Allied Commander of NATO and members of our UW faculty talking about what's going on in that relationship and what the geopolitical risks might be on the road ahead. Thanks for joining us. Look forward to seeing you again next week on Wisconsin. You can try, but you'll never stop a badger because we badgers are born with curious minds and endless heart. When we see a curve in the road, we speed up. When there are mass shortages for first responders, we make our own supply chain. When there's a world on pause, we sharpen our claws. Through thunder, fire, and pandemics, we'll keep going. Because after all, you can't stop a badger.